So good evening. We're so happy that you're here tonight. For those who don't know me, I think most of you do, but a few might not. My name is Sister Kathy Duffy, and I'm the director of the Institute for Religion and Science here at Chestnut Hill College. And so I would like to welcome you to our uh, college's Sugarloaf campus and to this evening's event. Um, for those who are here for the first time, is there anybody here for the first time? Yes, <laughs> there are a couple, good. And our speaker's here for the first time too. So a, a particularly warm welcome to the three of you. Um, <clears throat> for those who don't know that, no, uh, the Institute was founded about seven years ago to promote the constructive engagement of religion, spirituality with science technology, and to encourage dialogue that's interfaith, multi-science, and most of all, civil. And so we spo sponsor lectures and a reading circle. Some of our reading circle people here are here, and other events every once in a while. I'm starting to get some ideas about some other events, too that will enhance our institute. And uh, we have lots of videos from past events on our website, so if you're interested in them, you should really look at them. Some of them are extremely fine, and all of them are very good. So um, if you're not on our mailing list, be sure to get your name on there so that we can let you know what's coming up next. And then the other thing is, and I think Sam, you can probably set that up for us, the petition. Remember from before, if anyone wants to sign, especially after listening to this lecture, the petition that a group of us have um, put together asking Pope Francis to declare Teilhard a doctor of the church. If you're interested in doing that at the break or after it's over, please you know, sign up. That would be great to have a couple more signatures. We have over seven, or 1,600. So uh, we would like a few more, and we're getting ready to send um, a letter to the um, general, the Jesuit general, asking him to help to support us. So finally, um, I want to tell you about the flow for this evening, for those of you who you know, aren't familiar. What we'll have is, first of all, I'll introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Sack, and then um, I will... Um, and then Sue will, will give her lecture. And then after that, we'll take a few minutes to talk among ourselves. So when that happens, just move your chairs around into groups of five or six or something like that. Enough people so that you can really share what you've heard, you know, and prepare for the next section, which would be asking questions, comments, that kind of thing. So we'll, we'll hope uh, that we, that will enrich the night. It'll give us a chance to kind of mull over the information and think about what we would like to uh, share. And so now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce this evening's lecturer, Dr. Susan Kessman Sack. Sue, Sue uh, received her PhD in theology in 2014 from the University of Dayton. And I know that because I was on her committee. I was lucky enough to be one of the readers and um, enjoyed so much re learning more about Teilhard. And she's going to share that with us tonight. But Sue's career began, much like mine actually, in math and computer science. And after working as a systems analyst for many years and teaching um, uh, math and computer science at the college level, she began to study theology, at the, again, at the University of Dayton. After several years as a chaplain at Miami Valley North Hospital in Dayton, Ohio, she is currently um, pursuing certification as a spiritual director and will be moving back into parish ministry and uh, those kinds of things. Her book, which is called America's Teilhard will be published by the Catholic University of America Press in, this, in the winter now. I thought it was the spring, so that's great. Sue also has a vast interest in agriculture, as she and her husband, Larry, who's with us, 
have operated a small farm in southwestern Ohio for some three dozen years it is now, right? And so now I invite you to join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Sack to the Institute for Religion and Science. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you all for coming out tonight and battling the traffic and everything else to be here. I appreciate your attendance. And uh, I am very delighted to be uh, invited to be here. This is our, my first time in the Philadelphia area, so that's kind of cool, too. I don't know how we miss, we've been everywhere else in the country, but <laughs> we finally made it here. So. I'm going to be talking about Teilhard, Francoeur, and the religion science debates of the early 1960s. How many of you are familiar with Teilhard de Chardin? Pretty much everyone. All right, that's good to know. <laughs> Very good. So you know, okay, let me get this out. You know who this guy is? Yeah. This guy over here, his name is Bob Francoeur. Um, and we're going to be talking a good bit about him. He's important to my topic tonight. Otherwise, he wouldn't, otherwise he wouldn't be up there. <laughs> but down in the corner, you see my book cover, um, America's Teilhard, Christ and Hope in the 60s. And in the book, I'm doing a historiography of Teilhard's reception, how his work was received in the United States between 1959 and 1970. So my question was, why was it so incredibly popular during that time period? What was going on in the United States and in the minds of so many that, that as we will see, there were hundreds and hundreds of treatises written about Teilhard. And then why did it go away? For, not totally, but publications and interest dropped off precipitously at a certain point. And in the book, my, my uh, thesis is, is that, you know, not only was it societal influences that caused this, but also that those who were reading his work caught some of what he was about. Okay? But what they didn't understand was who Teilhard really was and where he came from. And this evening, I want to take just part of that, because that's such a huge topic to talk about in an hour. I want to take part of that and focus on those very first years and the people who were involved with introducing him in the United States and some of the publications around his work at that time, what was being said in those, okay? Um, and so we're gonna see a lot about what people thought he was about, why they were arguing about him, um, and what this U.S. phenomena was, right? So, since most of you know who Teilhard is, we're gonna go through that really fast and what his thinking points are and focus on what's the US phenomenon and some of the debates. So as we've already established, Teilhard, 1881, the Auvergne in France, died in 1955, pretty much in exile in New York City, one of 11 siblings, his father was an amateur naturalist, which influenced him greatly. His mother was very devout, especially to the Sacred Heart. And Teilhard grew up with two great loves, one for Christ, or one for matter, particularly geologic matter that lasted like iron, and the other for Christ, who really, not just matter, but who lasted, was Christ. And so it's probably no surprise that he entered the Jesuits um, in 1899 when he was still a fairly young man, was ordained in 1911, um, and 
because of his fascination with the god who last ended up studying geology and paleontology at the Museum of Natural History in Paris. Okay? And that became his life's focus. Slight detour for World War I, where he was a stretcher bearer, and that period was extremely pivotal for him, really caused him to focus on the value and the importance of suffering and struggle in life, which is what Kathy's book that's coming out is about. Wrote, did his first theological work during this time period. And after World War I, went on to do his doctoral work, taught at the Catholic Institute in Paris, and then went to China for the first time, North Africa and China, on some exploratory geological expeditions. And it was during this time period that the Mass on the World, one of his most beloved mystical works, was written when he was in the desert and had neither Eucharistic wafer or wine to offer, and offered up the world instead. Really beautiful work if you've never read it. Went back to France for a while, but got into some trouble because of some theological essays he had written on um, alternative understandings of original sin that were Hello. Oh, <laughs> sorry. That weren't meant to be circulated and that were and came before his superiors and he got called on the carpet. And then eventually he had to require, he had to sign a, a statement um, rescinding some of his views on evolution. And they suggested it would be very useful if he went back to China. <laughs> so he headed back to China and was there in China, mostly around Beijing, um, through World War II, okay, and was away from France during the war, which was very hurtful, very hard for him. But that time away allowed him to create the first geological map of China also, as well as to do a tremendous amount of other scientific work. So he worked on the Chinese National Geological Service. Um, okay. He was at Peter, the name. Tell me how you say the name. Chukudian. The excavations of Chukudian near Beijing, okay, where he took part in the discovery of Peking Man in 1929 with several other scientists. Um, he was part of the Yellow Cruise in Central Asia, which was sponsored by Citroen Auto. Okay. So, many, many wonderful scientific uh, explorations, and he was um, awarded numerous um, honors also for his scientific work. A little bit about Peking Man there, if you've never heard about that. Okay. Still, there's been several mysteries written concerning what happened to Peking Man, and where is it now? All this scientific work, though, very much helped to concurrently form Teilhard's theology. He was a mystic, you know, and this was also informed by his prayer life as a Jesuit. Okay? He was very much interested not only in the scientific form of evolution, but also how all daily human work, everything that we do on a daily basis, how that plays into how the world is evolving. Right? So you see this, this joining together, this melding from a very early time of faith, spirituality, religion, and science, and reason right? in his own life. And throughout his life, he struggled to put that on paper. He struggled to explain it to other people. And probably the way in which his, his truly greatest work 
in which he attempts to do that is the phenomenon. In French, the phénomène humain, okay, which he started writing in 1927. It wasn't completed until 1940. And this involves the unfolding of the cosmos, the material cosmos, from primordial particles through the development of life, the biogenesis, to human beings, and then on to the noosphere, what he called the noosphere, or the thinking skin of the universe. So Teilhard argues that that evolution occurs in a directional way, in a teleological way, toward an endpoint. And that endpoint he calls the omega point, which he associates with the cosmic Christ. Okay. And Humankind is truly pivotal. Humankind is where evolution comes into higher consciousness. Right? So all that humans do is pointing toward Christ, is his thought. We're all heading that way. I do want to make a point, though. Even though I talked about Teilhard's phenomenon, okay, None of his writing was permitted to be, none of his theological writing, anything that wasn't scientific, was permitted to be published during his lifetime. He tried, and he tried, and he tried. It was a true struggle for him, but it did not happen during his lifetime. Right? They were circulated, they were mimeographed, passed under the table, you know, contraband. <laughs> but at his death, all of that was bequeathed to his secretary, Jean Mortier, and then a circle of friends who came around that work and started to publish it um, in, after 1955. But despite all the struggles, and again, I am sure that Kathy's going to talk about this a lot in her book, he continued to be a Jesuit. He did not leave the order. Okay. So what is important about Teilhard? First, he offered hypotheses as well as a set of spiritual practices that blended science and faith. What was important for him was how to see the world, how to look at the world so that one might see the divine in all things. And nothing is profane for those who know how to see one of his great quotes. His work was dedicated to those who love the world, to those who are very much involved with the world. And he truly believed that the universe is in dynamic movement, that life, work, action, love, Contemplative living, all things are integrated and linked to what he called the divinization of our activities. That progress, therefore, is the spiritualization of all matter and all action. For Teilhard, all this is tied up with his Christology, what he says about Christ. So truly, this is what is key for him. And in my book, I say this is what people missed. You know, they looked at his work. He was so optimistic and so positive in what he wrote, so much about progress. But what they miss is that this is tied into his, his very deep faith in Christ that his recognition that what we call the Paschal mystery of life and suffering and rebirth is what is key. Okay? So his work is very incarnational. It's focused on daily activity. It's focused on the material world as being incredibly important, on both the good parts and the bad parts, and that it requires the cooperation of each of us if 
evolution is going to continue in a positive direction. So all that we do on a daily basis matters. Right? And again, seeing. He writes constantly about looking at the world in a particular way from a very contemplative viewpoint, seeing God in all things. Okay. So in the same manner, again, Christogenesis is what he calls this evolutionary process. He says that evolution is an ascent toward consciousness or a continuous upsurge in consciousness. That the world is evolving toward further unity and that all of creation is involved. Right? And this is why later some people, like Thomas Berry, for example, will pick up on that and talk about Teilhard and the ecology and the environment and how all of that is important, even the rocks, very much the rocks, of course. He, he was a geologist. And that Christogenesis is this movement toward the omega point, the cosmic Christ, the telos, the end point of the universe. And finally, okay, that God is present in all things, in the divine diaphany, the divine mayu, which is another of his very famous books, a beautiful book, I highly recommend, for those who, who learn how to see. He writes a great deal about the importance and the power of love. Right? That love alone can create the bonds necessary between all human beings and between humanity and God. I read that and I think if only we could learn that. Okay, so a quick background to Teilhard and his work. Now, moving on. So after his death in 1955, as I said, friends began to translate, to publish his work um, in France, okay, first in France. Les Amis de Teilhard with Jean Mortier and um, Henri de Lubac, who was a Jesuit priest, who was a friend of his, who helped him a great deal with some of his work and trying to get things published, um, started to translate some of his stuff also. And this huge body of secondary work also about Teilhard explicating his thought began to spring up. And after 1959, whoops, the phenomenon of man was published in the United States in English in 1959. And after that point, as I will show you in the next couple of slides, this huge explosion of work occurred here in the U.S. Why? Right? Because American society was at this threshold. You know, there was tremendous amount of political and social, religious change that was fermenting underground during the late 50s. And for many U.S. citizens, his worldview, this very optimistic worldview, focused on progress, focused on possibilities, just exploded onto the scene. Okay? And people were looking for something like this. So the viewpoint, the, the fact that here in the U.S. we're very practical, you know, we're very much about how do we get things done. We're very much about the material world, right? We like to be in control. And Teilhard's about the material world. He's about stuff. He's about loving what we have, 
loving life. Right? So there was that meshing. And also, especially during the 1960s, he, was, he had a lot of female friends. He wrote about the feminine and the importance of the feminine. This is a guy, he was exiled you know, for over 20 years. He knows what it's like to be an outcast, to be overlooked, to be ignored, to be put down. So he resonated, especially in the 60s, with certain populations. Okay? So for all those reasons, he was, his work was very much loved. However, there are also some issues. <laughs> and I've tried to capsulize them here very quickly. The main points were that people said, okay, this is very nice stuff, very interesting, but it's not really science. And it's also not really Catholic theology. I don't know what it is. We don't know what to do with it. And we're going to hear that and see that over and over again tonight. Many people said he has far too optimistic a worldview. This is not realistic. You know, you totally overlook evil and suffering. Right? What do you do with that? Right? And especially later on in the 70s and 80s, he began to be called a natural or a new age theologian. Again, not Catholic theology. He's far too concerned with the material world. Where's Jesus? Okay. Where's Jesus in your view of evolution? Well, despite all those points, or maybe because of them, I want to show you this chart here. And I think it speaks for itself. So in 58, now this is worldwide. So in 58, no books in the US yet. Europe, okay, 59, the phenomenon's published in the US. And you can just see how it just kind of explodes up through 1967 when there's 399 publications. Okay, and this is just books. This doesn't include articles and shows and everything else. TV, there are even TV shows. Um, and then suddenly, it drops off again. Okay. So I found this fascinating. What was going on? Oh, and what were people writing about and talking about and what were they taking from all of that? Or here is a chart that shows it the same way if you're more visual. Okay. So right about 1967, this huge upsurge and then bam, back off again. Okay. So we're going to look especially at what's going on in these years here, up to about right here, and just briefly touch on the later years. So 1959, HarperCollins comes out with the English version of Phenomena on a Man, with an introduction from Julian Huxley. Oh, and we'll get to him in a minute. Over 50,000 copies sold of this very dense book. Has anybody read The Phenomenon? Just a few of you. Yeah. Very dense, right? Not easy reading. 50,000 copies in two and a half years, less than two and a half years. Okay. And then the paperback edition in 61 sold 100,000 copies in about the same period of time. Right. So obviously, a lot of interest in this. So this is just the, ph the phenomenon copies. Okay. And a quote down there from the publisher. I love that. It's quite the reverse of the usual pattern with a new book, especially of this type. The sales numbers are really quite amazing. So even the publisher was shaking his head and scratching his head over what's going on here. 
But again, if we look at what's happening in this time period, I talked about changes. We got the post-war consensus of the 50s is falling apart. Catholic subculture is dissolving. New things happening in the Catholic Church, and initially that's who was into Teilhard. New educational opportunities for so many different people. This sense of optimism and progress. The papacy of John the 23rd coming in and, sh again, shaking up the Catholic Church and that spilling over into other Christian faiths. You know? And when I talk about educational opportunities, in science especially, right, the sciences are really expanding and new things happening there. We've got the space stuff going on, as well as many advancements in medicine at this time. Okay, I'm having trouble here. So some of the names that you will see, again, there's Bob Frankur, and perhaps you recognize some of those other names up there. These are the people who were talking about, had their own conversations in this time period in the US around Teilhard, some of whom worked with Teilhard or were neighbors, others who became involved later, including Robert Frankur. Um, Bob Frankur's story just fascinated me. I had the privilege of speaking with him several times before his death at the end of his life. And he was a fascinating man, he really was. Um, as we will see, he started off as a young seminarian, became a Catholic priest for a while, ended up leaving the church, and at the end of his life, uh, he got a PhD in evolutionary biology, was worked as an embryologist, and then as an academic sexologist, and was married and had several children, taught for many years at Fairleigh Dickinson in New Jersey. But he started out, he was from Detroit, Michigan, entered the seminary in Steubenville at Franciscan University, which I think is pretty hilarious, actually, if you know anything about Steubenville now, um, and went to pursue a master's degree at St. Vincent's in Latrobe, and was writing, you know, he told me he was on the bulge of all those young Catholic men who had this fervor for Jesus and entered the seminary and um, got caught up in Vatican II and all the changes at that time. So he was writing a master's thesis in theology, having trouble with it, and went to the library to work. And sitting on the table where he usually worked in the library was a copy of a magazine called Cross Currents. And in the journal uh, was an article about Teilhard and his theory of evolution by Monsignor Bruno de Solage. a French priest who knew Teilhard, okay? And Francoeur uh, was fascinated by this article and wanted to know more about this guy Teilhard. So his advisor suggested that he write the, the Salash, which he did, and he struck up a conversation that lasted for about 10 years. Eventually, that also came to include another French priest by the name of Claude Tresmontant, who was writing a book on Teilhard, uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, his thought. And that became the first book on Teilhard published in the US, by the way, in 1959. You see it up there. Um, Tresmontant was a lay theologian I said he was a priest. He was a lay theologian in France. And eventually, including in this circle, was also Walter Ong, the Jesuit. Ong had been Teilhard's neighbor in France, in Paris. 
while Ong was there doing some research for his own dissertation, and they became pretty good friends. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Ong actually suggests that Francoeur, who was going to translate Tresmontant's book, that he contact a particular publishing company because it was obvious that the Catholic intellectual field needed to be built up in the United States at that time. So I wanted to show you these couple of quotes from Walter Ong and letters to Francoeur, which I thought were pretty interesting. You know, and then the first one, where he's talking about how Teilhard's thought grows and being transmitted, and then it becomes impossible to separate it from your own interpretation or your own meanings and thoughts. Right? I found that fascinating because as I learned more about Teilhard and I studied him, and especially, we're not gonna get into this tonight, but when I looked at what happened with Vatican II, and you start to see Teilhard's thoughts all through the documents of Vatican II. You know? And as a theologian, I went through and tore all those apart, and it's like, man, it's everywhere. It just became so much a part of the water that we drank in the 1960s. Well, whether you recognized it or not, you were drinking it. Right? And we continue to drink it. Um, and as well as Ong's thought down here, unless we can lay hold of contemporary knowledge and thinking in a more positive and creative way than we have done, Christ's kingdom will suffer horribly once again from our own maladroitness and smugness. Such a great quote. So he encourages Francoeur to go on and to continue to work on these Teilhard projects, but to take care. And he tells him in another letter, you know what happened to Teilhard. Right? You know, be aware. Another person whom Francoeur began to communicate with was Dorothy Poulang. And she herself was a writer living in France with her husband, who was also a writer, Didier Poulain. Um, they, I say 1957, but it was actually 59. They started to correspond. Poulain was very active in Les Amis de Teilhard in France, and she very much wanted something similar in her home country an organization that would take Teilhard's books and get them published and distributed in the U U.S. And so she's going to encourage Frank Kerr also to do something similar. Someone else whom probably many of you are familiar with is Julian Huxley. As I said, he wrote the introduction to the English translation of the phenomenon. Um, he was very much a champion of what we would call neo-Darwinian -Dar evolutionary theory. But he also, in 1959, at the Darwin Conference in Chicago, I find this fascinating, Huxley predicted a new evolutionary kind of religion that had its foundation in Teilhard's thought. And he took a lot of heat for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, not what anybody was expecting from him. But obviously he was very transformed and fascinated by what Teilhard was writing. He was also later the first director of UNESCO and a founding member of the World Wildlife Fund. So that influence continued on in his life. Okay. So a couple of people, we'll see more later. I want to show you, though, one of the very first articles. Teilhard was in time numerous times, numer numerous occasions. Uh, the first article, 1959, called Toward Omega. It sums up what I was saying before. Okay? Scientists welcomed Teilhard's thought, a synthesis, 
They're not too sure about this omega stuff. And, and neither are the theologians. Not sure what to do with that. Another article, 1959, in a Catholic magazine called Jubilee by a guy named Wilf Wilfred Sheed, uh, the Christian phenomenon, Pierre Teilhard's view of evolution. And basically, Sheed is asking, okay, what's going on with evolution? Why is it that this papal encyclical from the 1950, Humani Generi Generis, called evolution a plausible hypothesis, okay? And yet, Catholics still won't accept it. Or they accept it only, he says, with bad grace. So Pius XII, who wrote the encyclical, was sounding a challenge in asking Catholics to take evolution as a hypothesis into fullest consideration without fear. And yet, she says, Teilhard is the only one who's been willing to do that. So what's going on? Okay. And in doing that, Teilhard has come under all kinds of fire from both the science side as well as the theological side. Okay. And she says that the, it's the overall vision of the phenomenon that's most important because it plays throughout on the reader's capacity to wonder. And she is the son of the founders of Sheed and Ward Publishing, by the way, if you're wondering. So Frank Kerr ended up taking all of this and the encouragement from many others and deciding to publish a book. It's a book of edited essays, uh, the first book on Teilhard published in the US by an American author called The World of Teilhard. And it both looks at the organic nature of Teilhard's work and tries to replicate that within the book. So, Frank Kerr says that this was difficult, you know, because Teilhard's thought isn't what we necessarily think of as science, and yet it's not really theology, it's not metaphysics, it doesn't fit in into any good category. So they kind of ran the gamut. Their hope was that the essays would try to at least approach a synthesis of disciplines from the same perspective as does Teilhard's thought. Um, and there are 15 essays from a wide variety of people we have excuse me let me show you this we have george barbour who was a geologist you see john lafarge who was very active in social justice affairs in the new york city area and was also a neighbor of tayards in new york who wrote the introduction uh, an ecclesiologist, a theolo couple theologians, psychiatrists, uh, historians, philosophers. Okay. There's a medical doctor in there. He's not up here right now. So each is attempting from that particular author's viewpoint to build bridges across the disciplines of theology, science, philosophy, and the social sciences. One of these, I already mentioned him, George Barbour, wrote an essay at Work in the Field, which he later uses to build on for his own book. He was a professor in geology, of geology in China where he met Teilhard and was on the team that discovered Peking Man. He is Scottish, educated at Cambridge and I thought it was pretty cool. He taught at and retired from the University of Cincinnati, near where we live, 
uh, was there for quite a few years. So they have his papers there at UC. Uh, extensively honored for his ge uh, geographic work and his geological work. Mm -hmm. And at the same time in this book, we have J. Edgar Bruns, another person who turned out to be a great friend of uh, Frank Kerr, a theologian from Louisiana who was teaching at St. John's in New York at the time on cosmogenesis and theology. And he's looking at Teilhard's theology and saying, you know, his theology is not so different, including his omega point, it's not so different from what the Greek fathers said, especially Gregory of Nyssa, what they said about the parousia, about evolution, about how we are growing toward God. So this isn't really anything new. What are you getting so excited about, people? <laughs> you know, you should know this. Bruns also makes the point of saying this is what is foundational for Teilhard. His Christology, this is what is really driving him and his work, both his scientific work and his spiritual writings, is his Christology. Okay. Other contributors to Frank Kerr's book, the psychiatrist James L. Foy, actually from the Washington, D.C. area, who wrote about man and the behavioral sciences. Um, he says that Teilhard's book is a scientific formulation of a theory of biogenesis and anthropogenesis. And there are so many possible applications of his ideas to neurology, to neurophysiology, to psychology, to psychiatry, and that he is very much interested in how Teilhard reads history also. Okay. John Walsh from Peace College, a historian, wrote History in the Phenomenon of Man. Um, and he says, well, there is no line in history which is not a vector line. Every line has a direction. And that this is exactly what Teilhard has done in his phenomenon. Just laid out the vectors. I mentioned Henri de Lubac earlier. Henri de Lubac started writing his Teilhard books and publishing them in 1959. Okay. And why he decided to do this Again, he says, it's more than time for Christians to pay some attention to the universality of Christ and the hopes resulting from this. The primary question is, where are we heading? And the second quote here, so important, you know, especially today. Those who are unable to perceive what is the essential question at any given moment of the world's history so near, see no reason why the question should be posed. Isn't that the truth? Okay. If you don't want to see it, you're not going to ask why should it be posed. Someone else who you might not expect who was taken with Teilhard was Thomas Merton, okay. the Trappist monk from Gethsemane in Kentucky. Someone sent Merton a copy of the phenomenon. He read it, he loved it, he wrote a review of it, which his abbot then refused to allow him to publish <laughs> and gave him all kinds of flack about it and it didn't get published for quite a while after that. But um, actually it didn't get published until 1979 in a book called Love and Living from him. Um, and as he says here, his essay was concerned with the spiritual implications of his scientific religious mystique. Okay. And also, in another article on Teilhard, Merton talks about the need to share the aspirations in his essence religious of those people who strongly feel the beauty and potential of the world and the sacred value of every new truth. 
This we do not for the sake of progress itself, but because these living developments are clues to God's will for our future direction. They are an expectation of the parousia, or the end times. Not to do this is to exhibit infidelity and distrust in God. As a Merton fan, I was very excited when I found those articles. So, Frank Kerr and his friends, many of those people I already talked about, made the decision already in 1960 um, to form what they called a Teilhard Circle at Fordham to encourage discussion of Teilhard's work through the anthropological lens. So we have Lewis Marx in biology, Joe Doncille in philosophy, Franklin Ewing in theology, um, start to talk about these things. You were cousins who went to teaching classics there, found that they were meeting like every month to talk about Teilhard. And then Frank Kerr ended up going there to do his graduate studies also, shortly afterwards. Another thing that was happening early, again, I thought this was amazing, but there was the Knights of Columbus put on a show about Teilhard in 1960 that was actually aired, aired numerous times because it got such good press. So evolution, science, and religion, Frank Kerr, J. Franklin Ewing, Gustav Weigel, the ecclesiologist, John Walsh, the historian, and then Walter Burkhardt, um, who was a theologian, who was the commentator for this. And then this was also published later on in Jubilee Magazine, the transcription of it. Right. Jubilee, by the way, was started by Merton and his friends in the 1950s. So a couple comments from the show that I thought were appropriate. So talking about Teilhard's synthetic ability, the idea of a dis direction was so important. Teilhard gives people hope he can be a modern man and still be a Christian. Okay. Ewing publishes uh, an article that says the same thing a year later. His question in this article, can the new evolutionism of Chardin win back the de-Christianized intellectuals of the space age by liberating theology from the old cosmology? Again, he talks about the, the hostility in the Catholic world especially concerning Darwin and science. And he says, again, this isn't new. I don't know what you're getting upset about. OK. One more article from this time. A philosopher, John Whitney Evans, publishes in Commonweal. And he says he struggles that all the elements of the cosmos, that Teilhard acts or believes all the elements of the cosmos uh, exist and act as if they had reason, okay? that they are conscious. And he says, in, that was his primary sticking point, and he also says that the text of the phenomenon is so ambiguous that anyone could basically read it and from diametrically opposing viewpoints, people can be happy with it and find something in there that they like. And so how can that be satisfying? Okay. So Frank Kerr comes back and he compares Teilhard with Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. He looks at the influences of Darwin and of Henri Bergson's creative evolution on Teilhard and says, hey, so materialists have forced this one-sided theory of evolution on people. Okay. And Teilhard instead tries for this synthesis. Teilhard says, 
his work is tentative. He admitted that. He didn't have the opportunity to talk about it and to have it published and to get feedback, and that's part of the problem. You know, Frank Kerr says again, you have to remember, Teilhard was writing for atheists and agnostics as much as for those in the church. He was starting a conversation. Okay, I think I'm going to skip that. So, about this time, though, we start to see beyond these articles in the paper that there is more pushback. Frank Kerr's book is mentioned in a review and the American Benedictine Review in 1961. This gets the papal legate, um, Archbishop Vignasi, very upset that this book is even being mentioned. And so he goes and he gets a monitum, a warning placed on the book, which basically says, you shouldn't be reading it, this has stuff in it that is uh, possibly dangerous to your faith. And um, they refused to give Frank Kerr an imprimatur, an approval from the Catholic Church, right? which very much upsets Frank Kerr. And Frank Kerr says, oh, Teilhard's critics want to go back. You know? They want to regress. They fear change. That's the big problem. He calls them reactionaries, ultra-conservatives. And he says, you don't understand. Teilhard is speaking a language that the contemporary world can understand. Critics aren't offering other options. They just want to condemn. Okay. Frank Kerr says, you can't hide from the possibilities created by the synthesis of science and research. That's not a healthy sign of vigorous intellectual life it will impede our country's progress. De Lubach also gets called on the carpet, gets chastised at first, and then the Jesuits come back and tell him, there's too much nonsense being written about Teilhard. Go write some good stuff. Write what he really said. All right. Which he does, however, in the end, there is a monetum, a warning about Teilhard's work put out from the Vatican. So as this reads, the fathers of the Holy Office exhort all ordinaries and superiors of religious institutes to protect the minds of the youth against the dangers presented by the works of Teilhard de Chardin. Okay. <laughs> Now, we laugh about it now, <laughs> but this just devastated many of these people who had been working so hard to get his work out there. So, Ottaviani of the Curia wanted to condemn, put de Lubach's book on the Index of Forbidden Books. John the 23rd said no, though, and that's a clue right there. You know? John the 23rd said no. And de Lubach comes back and basically says, they just don't understand. They don't understand how important this is. All right? And then all the letters start flying back and forth across the Atlantic. And Poulain, writing to Frank Kerr, says there's too many conservatives, they know nothing of science, they know less about Teilhard, they need to have a conversion. And she says, you better take care of yourself because they'll come be coming after you next. Protect yourself. And then she writes back and says, oh, well, they decided not to come down on Teilhard quite so much because they discovered that he was bringing lots of people, atheists, into the church around the world. 
and this is a good thing. <laughs> you know, which is what Teilhard was trying to do. So, and the monetum didn't necessarily mean a condemnation, it just meant that it would probably be better if young people read more traditional stuff first. Okay. Edgar Bruns writes to Frankur and says, yep, the critics want to put back time, but remember, the more the Fuhrer, the more people are attracted. And he tells Frank Kerr, be discreet, okay? Be discreet. If things will get difficult for you, just as they did for Teilhard now. But your devotion will be a recommendation to those who honor Teilhard in the pursuit of truth. I don't know if anybody knows Gregory Baum, who is a great Canadian theologian. He actually wrote a, a, an article on the Monetum when he was out in Iowa, of all places, um, and just explains a little bit about what it actually meant, that it was the church trying to protect truth with the modern idea of academic freedom. Right? Wasn't necessarily taken that way by everybody, but... George Barber, very important comment, and I was talking to Kathy about this earlier, when he writes, I assume you followed in Teilhard's steps and suffered for your beliefs. Others have before or now. You find yourself in good company. Okay. Barber is working to publish this book here, and he tells Frank Kerr too, I'm trying to be very discreet and be very careful about what I write, so I don't get in any more trouble with Rome. Okay. And then Pauline writes back again and says, well, maybe the council will change things, although we don't really know. They're talking about Vatican Council. I was getting ready to start. He says, if things don't change, we're headed toward a real crisis. What a time to be alive. Kind of feel like that right now. What a time to be alive, convergence or the opposite, right? Convergence, of course, being big Teilhard theme. So, you know, as we go on from this time period, what happens is that things start to open up. So we have Vatican II coming along, which changes a lot in the church. The Kennedys, fascinating how they were very much Teilhardians. Bobby Kennedy, Sergeant Shriver, Robert Mueller, who was Secretary of State for John Kennedy. Um, Sarge Shriver actually would put copies of the phenomenon in the boxes that went out to the, um, oh my gosh, Okay, the young people who went overseas to work. Peace the Peace Corps, thank you. Boy, that went out of my head. In the, in the Peace Corps book boxes, they put copies of the phenomenon in there. Oh, because he was such a, a fan. As I mentioned, John the 23rd and Vatican II changed so much. We have this letter from Dorothy Pelaine, again to Frank Kerr, telling him how everybody in Europe is waiting for the breaking of the spell under which the American giant has been sleeping for so long. And may he roar. Yeah. This is your gold opportunity. Every enlightened Catholic will be cheering you. So what a great letter. So she's encouraging him to move ahead. We saw more organizations starting what they called the Human Energetics Institute, again at Fordham in 63. 600 people show up for the first conference. Well, human Energetics was about healing the rift between the scientific and the humanistic, the secular and the religious. The importance of cross-disciplinary study. I'm going to skip that. Oh. 
If you know Flannery O'Connor? Yes. She very much enjoyed Teilhard also and wrote quite a bit. You know, um, everything that rises must converge straight from Teilhard. Right? So she was during this time period writing about him. We see in U.S. history all these movements, all this movement forward that was happening and Teilhard, it was during this time period, there, you know, the number of books and writings on his work just surges up because it's all meshing. And then, finally, the American Teilhard Association is formed in 65. Not just to expand the thought of Teilhard, but also to talk about the integration of developments in science, sociology, religion, and philosophy. You know, and this continues till today. I think it's fascinating. It tells us so much when we look at who were the first people involved with the Teilhard Association. If you look at where they're coming from and what their specialties are, it's all across the board. Bob Frank Kerr is on there. You'll notice he is now an assistant professor of biology at Fairleigh Dickinson, where he will leave. He has left his religious life. He has married, oh, and he's got babies on the way at this time. Right? He was recalled by his bishop back to Steubenville, chastised, had his hand slapped numerous times. They tried to keep him there, and instead he walked out is what happened. And then the board of the advisory board, again, same sort of wide range of people involved. George Barbour, Thomas Berry's up there, you know, down to people involved in pragmatic mysticism. Jean Houston, if you've ever heard that name before. Jean Houston, she was actually a little girl, a new Teilhard as a little girl who she would go out and talk with and take walks with. And didn't realize till later who he was. Okay. And I just want to point out, things, he was so popular at this time, there is a conference in Chicago, the first Midwest conference, the first one outside the Catholic Church. And there were 500 people attending every night. Okay. And George Crespi, who was a well-known European author, not Catholic, is said to have looked out at all the people attending and said, who are these people? <laughs> Where, why are they here? Okay. And it was televised. It was televised weekly over a period of time. Okay. So, I'm going to move ahead, and I want to talk about Zygon. Is anybody familiar with Zygon? I'm sure you are. So it started during this time period also, was greatly influenced by what was happening on the Teilhard scene as a journal that also would look at this synthetic view between the sciences and theology. Okay. And uh, started at Meadville Theological School. And in fact, the December 1968 issue was totally devoted to Teilhard. And um, I thought it was fascinating that they're looking at, you know, is Teilhard's theology scientific enough or is science insufficient to handle theological questions? And the consensus of those involved with this particular issue was that it was so difficult to try to do some kind of synthesis of all the topics they talked about that they could understand how Teilhard struggled to do the same thing and why his work was received, was, it was so difficult to understand on the part of other people to understand what he was doing too and why there's so much conflict over it. So, to close this, so you can take a break, again, I want to show you this list. Okay. 
After 1968, as I talk about in the book, things fell apart. We had all sorts, I call them the bitter years, riots, you know, assassinations, the Vietnam War protests, uh, the yippies, you might remember the, um, the difficulties in Chicago with presidential nominations. This is a list of some of the publications during that time period about Teilhard, and they're still there across the spectrum. Quite a few of them are talking about his Christology, quite a few of them are talking you know, interdisciplinary stuff. You see a number from Zygon there. There's a number um, about spirituality in general, and then also just for a secular audience that completely cuts out all of his theology. This one is fascinating because it, all it is is diagrams. Page after page after page of diagram out of San Francisco. I don't know, maybe that explains it all. <laughs> but I do just want to point out, you know, obviously this continues on. And over the years, there's been quite a few people who have tried to pick up Teilhard's legacy and moved on. And Kathy is up there with Thomas Berry and Ilya Delio and Brian Swim and John Hodd or Silla King. This guy down here, Paolo Soleri, has anybody ever heard of him? Fascinating man, Billy, trying to build a Teilhard city, planned community out in the Southwest. Okay. And I want to thank you for listening and staying awake. And I thought this last quote from Cardinal Casarelli uh, from 1998 kind of sums all of this up. You know, that Teilhard is this testimony to a man who was possessed by Christ in the depths of his soul, who was concerned with honoring both faith and reason, you know, and who anticipated Pope John Paul II's appeal to open wide to Christ the doors of all the domains of culture, civilization, and progress. Thank you. So thanks so much, Sue. I think we really got a great overview of uh, what was going on during these times. Uh, what's very interesting, too, I just, um, you know, while I was doing my work last year, I was able to get a paper from uh, Marie Bayon de la Tour, who is the grand niece. I always say granddaughter, and that can't be true. Grand niece of Teilhard. And um, it's uh, called, uh, it's by Leroy, one of Teilhard's very good friends. And it's um, about how Teilhard would talk about anguish, uh, you know, of the time. And it was 1968, just as you showed all of those things. And what we were doing, we're publishing it in Teilhard's study. So the next Teilhard study will be about that. But it's amazing everything that happened throughout the world, not just here, but throughout the world during that time. So uh, that's really um, interesting even to see that that was the year when things peaked and then fell down.